felt about that video, but sadly, that's the best video that I could find. And I looked very hard. Um, so let's talk about secondary cementitious materials. You might say, Dr. Cook, what are you talking about secondary cementitious materials? Well, people have found out, number one, Portland cement's real expensive. So how can we reduce the cost and still not suffer too bad about the, the, the performance of the concrete? Um, and over time, people have started adding things to the concrete mix to see how they perform. So in this case, um, SCMs are used, secondary cementitious materials, to, you know, you can take out some of the cement and add some of, of this SCM. And again, they're usually byproducts from other industries like I talked about. Here's some of the basics. Again, they all look like little, little, little powders. Um, some are, you know, different particle sizes. You can probably see here that they, they kind of look a little different. Some are coarser, some are a lot finer. SCMs are going to, for the most part, replace part of the cement. So it may be 20% is real common in Oklahoma for class C fly ash. Um, we do have some slag of an Oklahoma City terminal, 35 to 50% you may see. Um, silica fumes really not used in Oklahoma, but every once in a while for a, for a job, especially for high strength concrete, they may come in like the Devon Tower that was built in Oklahoma City. They use some silica fume um, to get up there. So I actually knew the guy that designed the concrete for the Devon Tower. Um, and so that's a lot of stuff he used. He had it specially brought in. So there's different types of secondary cementitious materials, SCMs. You have fly ash, which is the most common SCM out there. So we all have energy from coal fire power plants in, in Oklahoma. Um, you know, we also get energy from places like we have high, uh, hydroelectric dams, such as in uh, Langley Disney area. We have the largest, uh, largest multiple arch dam in the world. It generates uh, electricity in 24 counties called the Pensacola Dam. Um, but we also have other things like coal plants. These coal plants, um, like I talked about a little bit, I think uh, the first first or second lecture, um, whenever you're burning coal, it's going to put in the furnace, the bottom ash. So whenever you burn, you know, coal, or maybe you do a brush pile, you have ash that goes up in the air. That's, you know, in this case, we call it fly ash when we're burning coal, and the stuff that goes to the bottom is called bottom ash. Well, fly ash works really well in concrete, bottom ash, not so much. I'm actually on a FHWA project right now where we're trying to figure out how to use bottom ash. Um, so it's pretty cool. But there's two different classes of fly ash. So the ash that goes up, that's, that's caught in the filters. Um, there's class F and class C. And the biggest difference between them is one acts a little bit more like a cement and one acts like something that's more inert, meaning it doesn't react at all, it's just kind of there. Um, so class C is what we have in Oklahoma where it does act a little bit more like a, a, like a cement, but it also does have those pozzolanic properties. Um, so where, where they don't really react too much. Class F in other states um, is a little bit more common. Um, I think there's 28 different fly ashes in Texas and they have both C and F and they've been running out because um, flash is actually, you know, being the, the coal fire power plants are actually being converted over to natural gas. So um, this is what, when you look at flash under a microscope, 
They're actually a lot more spherical. When you look at cement, it's a lot more jagged. So again, fly ash for Oklahoma is about 20% is real common. You go south to down in Texas, it's 25. You go up to Kansas, you're going to be looking at a lot more like 10, 15%. Um, class C, uh, we typically we will use that just to, as an economical replacement in Oklahoma. Class F um, and other states, they may have ASR problems, so alkali silica reaction, where the um, alkalis in the cement and the silica and the rock or the sand will interact and cause micro cracking, um, maybe 10 to 30 years down the road. And so class F doesn't have the alkali content that cement does, so they'll use that as a replacement. Um, other times class F is used to lower the heat of hydration. So like I talked about with the type four cement, well, you can use a class F um, to kind of mitigate some of that. You can also use a class C, doesn't react um, as high as Portland cement, but a class F has a lot less calcium. So it'll, it won't react the same way. So in any of these materials I've been talking about, aggregates, cement, fly ash, um, we'll talk about slag and, and other SCMs here in a minute, they're going to have a report that gets filled out. So you've been doing memos to me of, of how, how things get tested. A report's really um, for if you're manufacturing a product and you're trying to communicate the products, uh, what the product, how it performs and the specifications. So you may get a piece of paper that has a report. We talked about a mill cert last uh, class period. This is called a fly ash report, which provides the chemical composition. It also provides, you know, some basic physical um, characteristics too. So the blame, that's the fineness, blame fineness. So how the particle distribution looks, the activity index. So what they do is they make 100% concrete mix so 100% Portland concrete mix, and they compare that with, say, um, a certain percentage with, um, with fly ash in there. And that the difference has to be, has to meet a, that, that percent different, there's a minimum that has to meet. Also in this fly ash report, people focus on the calcium content. Um, currently, according to ASTMC 618, if you're at 18% or under, that's where you're class F. If you're above 18%, that's whenever you're class C. So calcium content, I'll say this again, the calcium content dictates if you're class C or class F for fly ash. So let's switch gears. Another very common um, SCM is called slag, also called slag cement or blast furnace slag. There's a lot of different names for it. So you kind of have to be careful when, when people are referring to um, or referring to the actual slag powder or are you referring to, you know, when it's actually in concrete. Um, so there, there's, so there's some, you know, the terminology needs to get fixed a little bit, but when I'm talking about this slag powder. It's a byproduct from the steel industry. And they'll actually take these, um, they'll actually take that powder and actually grind it up finer. Um, and that, that depends on what grade it is. So usually most places in, in the United States will use a 100 grade. Um, and they'll focus a lot more, the slag has a lot more like cement properties than a, as opposed to pozzolanic properties. So it's, so it's a lot more reactive and say like a class F or a class C fly ash. Um, you'll actually see earlier strengths. It can mitigate ASR because you're reducing the alkalis in the um, cement because there's not as many alkalis in the slag. And it will also reduce, uh, reduce hydration. So if you're doing mass pours like a dam 
or gigantic foundation for a building and you're worried that the thermal cracking uh, generated from the cement and the water together is going to crack um, going to crack that 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 concrete structure you can actually use slag or you know class uh, f y ash to reduce that so this is kind of an illustration of where uh, where in the um, steel industry, how they're using all their products, they're putting it in a um, furnace, a blast furnace, and actually heating everything up. Down here is actually, it's kind of like the top trash is the slag, that stuff's taken off, and then they will let it cool and they will just regrind it. Um, so, steel mills in the United States is where you get your slag from. We don't have steel mills everywhere anymore, so a lot of slag is actually being imported. The slag that, that I used a lot was um, actually from China. This is what slag looks like under a microscope. So you saw flash was nice and a lot smoother, round. Well, slag is a lot more jagged. Um, it looks a little bit more like you see with like cement. Cement's not nice and round either. So the grades of slag is going to be based on that 28 day strength. So you compare 100% cement with a certain amount of slag that's added to the concrete mix, same mix. And that change, um, that change in 28 day strength depends on the grade. And you can actually grind it to be more reactive or less reactive. Typically, you're going to use a 100 grade. That's what most people use. Every once in a while, I'll see a 120. Nobody really wants an 80 grade because that really lowers the strengths of your concrete below 100%. So you really want to see something like that. A slag report, you're going to look at the blame fineness the specific gravity, um, and then obviously the grade and the strength index at 728. So those are kind of the, the basic numbers there. But again, whether you're looking at uh, slag or class F fly, or F fly ash or cement, you're going to have a physical analysis, a chemical analysis. Um, that's just kind of how it is. It's important to kind of realize what parameters you need to look at. So silica fume, this is probably least used out of the, um, when you look at uh, slag, fly ash, and then um, silica fume is probably like the third most common, but it's not as used as well. It's used in very low replacement volumes. So maybe 5%, 10%, something like that. Um, you really want to use it for high strength because it's, very, 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 very small particles. Um, it creates a very tight pore structure. Um, it does lower your workability, but it can really increase your strengths, uh, double, triple, quadruple your strengths, depending on how your mix looks. Um, it's, it's a byproduct from the silicone computer chip plant. Uh, so this is kind of a, an illustration. You have, again, you have a furnace. Um, and then you have this micro silica here that comes out um, from, you know, from whenever you're actually uh, uh, melting from that furnace, the silica um, gets caught. So this is what cement looks like at, under a microscope. So it's very jagged, a little bit more square than maybe uh, slag, but not much. This is the same scale, so this is really small, fine particles. So they can pack a lot better together. Um, so you get higher strengths. So we'll talk a lot more next time about hydration. But I want to give you a little bit of a of a glimpse into the next uh, on Wednesday's lecture. So probably the most important property in in concrete is strength. Well, how do you get your strengths? That depends a lot on your cement, 
the wire cement ratio, the SCMs that are used. There's a lot that goes on. And uh, kind of the way I always explain, if you think about like a 1960s rocket ship that's going up in the air, they have different stages. Um, you know, there's different stages that, 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 that shoot that rocket right up in the air. So the cement, the C3A in the cement, and the C2S, that's kind of like stage one, stage two. You may have that cementitious properties, meaning you have your, your SCM that kind of reacts like a, uh, the axe reacts like a cement, so like a class C fly ash or um, slag will kind of react here too, especially uh, the stage two. And then seven, maybe 28 days, uh, 56 days, you'll start seeing this C2S and the pozzolan. So maybe class F fly ash, you'll start seeing that react over time. So that's kind of how some of the chemicals, they don't just react initially, but some of them react at later ages, some react um, initially. So you just kind of got to be aware, like when I say the Hoover Dam is hydrating, um, is still hydrating over time. Yeah, all concrete hydrates over time. So the longer you let that concrete set, the, 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 the uh, higher the strengths will most likely be, assuming there's water in that concrete. So um, I'll talk more about strength, but it's not unheard of for at 28 days. So you have 3000 PSI. Well, if you test it 10 years from now, it may be 9000 PSI. Um, so kind of how, uh, you know, I talked about this reaction and how everything kind of reacts together, the cement, um, these different cementitious, secondary cementitious materials, how does all kind of that work? So when we talk about set, so as the concrete's getting hard, you kind of have your initial set where, where, the, where that concrete will initially start setting up and will start strengthening. Final set is whenever it's actually, when it's, uh, when it's completely hard. So um, these lower ones next to it on the left, that is your initial set, your final set's gonna be higher. So what they do is they measure, with this ASTM, they measure, they push down on a, a sample of mortar. So you have 100% cement, so 100% Portland cement has a very quick setting, um, setting time. But as you add, say, 20% fly ash, it's gonna take longer to set up. 30% slag, it may even take longer than that. Um, it just depends on, you know, with your, with your flash and your slag, what, what the chemical composition is. If this is an F, it may actually be higher and the slag may be lower. This is just an example. And then your silica fume, it may just jump up slightly compared to your Portland cement. Again, this is just one example. Um, whenever you start putting these materials together, what they look like. You can also talk about compressive strengths. So I, I measured 1, 3, 7, 28, and 56. The very first one is 100% Portland cement. And then you have maybe 20% fly ash. So that's going to be slightly lower. Um, especially at your, your initial days. So one and three and seven, you're gonna be lower. Um, 28, so you still may be a little bit lower, but by that 56 day, you may actually have um, higher strengths or just as high of strength um, as 100% Portland cement mix. So um, slag, um, does act, it's more of like a cementitious material, so it acts more like a cement. So you may see at, um, at 7, 28, 56, it may be actually higher than your Portland cement mix. And silica fume, um, be, because of how it packs, it may even be more 
the whole time it may actually have higher strengths than your 100% coolant cement. Um, so a lot of times with these SCMs, especially class F fly ash, what will happen is when the concrete gets hard, one of the major compounds that really just contributes to the pH of the concrete. Um, concrete has a pH of about 12 and a half to 13. That's about what Drano is. So um, it can really take a lot. It's because of that calcium hydroxide. So what will happen, calcium hydroxide is pretty weak when it comes to strength and stuff. But this class F fly ash that has silica in it, it will actually react and produce this thing called CSH. And that actually contributes to most of your strength, um, especially at uh, past your first couple days. Um, so this contributes a lot to your strengths. Um, so it will actually give you that bump on that 56 day number, 28 day number. Um, and it doesn't affect the, the um, it doesn't cause cracking or anything like that. Um, so one question I always got from people was how do you know, you know, whenever I go and I'm taking this cement with this fly ash or with this slag, how do you put everything together? How, how do you really understand that system? These are the materials I can use. How do I make a better concrete mix? And what I always tell people is number one, look at your mill cert, ask your material supplier, um, you know, look at your, your, your uh, report. Do you have a class C fly ash or class F fly ash? What grade of slag do you have? What type of Portland cement do you have? How reactive is it, that Portland cement? Um, a lot of times if, if you're kind of like maybe a paving contractor and you use a lot of different cement or a lot of different uh, materials, every project has completely different materials, then you probably need to start doing mock-ups where you go out and you actually, before you pour the concrete, you make either a small pour somewhere and just kind of do some testing to see if that mix works right when you're combining everything together. Um, trial batches in a lab can act actually save a lot of time and money too, when you can just design a standard concrete mix and then you can take out materials and put new ones in and stuff to kind of interchange it. So exam two, I'll talk a lot more about that. Um, another thing I'll talk a little bit more about next or next lecture is these calorimetry curves. So when cement and water react, they produce heat. And you can actually measure that heat, that rate of heat that's being produced. It can highlight low strength issues. It can highlight setting time issues. Uh, it can highlight incompatibility where maybe this cement and this fly ash don't work or this cement, this fly ash and this admixture together don't work um, very well. Um, so this calorimetry can really help out. So if you have a normal heat curve, this, I messed this up, but you're not supposed to see that. If you have a normal heat curve there. Um, if you have a fast setting, that means like the bottom right there or bottom left, then you're going to see um, that line, that curve kind of smush in. If it has a slower setting, then it's going to be more elongated. So it's going to take longer to produce heat. If you have like a double pump, like you see here, that may be an incompatibility issue. It may just be your C3A kicking off a little late. Especially if you have a, a bump in the front, that means you will have strength and setting time issues, guaranteed. Um, so this, this can really help out. Kind of, you know, especially if you're in trial batching in the lab, really help out stuff. Another thing you can do if you're a ready mix producer is break cylinders over time and kind of look at if you have one mix, you can break a cylinder um, weekly. 
You can break so many cylinders and you can just see how well your concrete's performing. Um, when you can actually take these charts, maybe you have a test value, a target, you have a minimum and a, and a maximum. You can actually plot your data and that can really help out